Canada has been blending ethanol in its gasoline for decades to reduce emissions. And uh, the problem there is that it's, it's made from plants, often corn, and that's problematic. And, but a company in Sweden, Liquid Wind, has come up with a way to make methanol, which is a close chemically, as a liquid fuel and zero emission. So we're going to talk to Klaus Fr uh, Fredriksson, the founder, and welcome to the interview, uh, Klaus. Thanks very much. Nice to be here. Now, why don't you give us uh, an overview of what your company does and why it's important? So our company has as its business to be a developer of facilities that will produce fuel. And so what I mean by that is that we put together all the bits and pieces to actually build a factory, get the financing to get that factory built, build a factory, and then supply the fuel. Now in the process, because we use project financing as a means to get funded, we actually sell the fuel up front to a large off-taker who will take the entire capacity for the fuel, the entire capacity of the plant fuel and, and use that or buy that for something like five to 10 years. That's part of the financing. But so yeah, that, that's what we do. We make sure factories get built. We do it in Sweden first. We will build our first one starting from next year. And we wanna do it globally as we get better and smarter and, and better at supporting others who also wanna build plants. Well, let's talk about methanol as a fuel. So uh, is methanol, will it be used like ethanol as a blend with gasoline or diesel? Or are we talking about, you know, big trucks running on 100% methanol? It can definitely be both. And, and the blend part is the easy part. We can blend in 5, 10, 15, even up to 25% methanol in gasoline. That's what they do already today in, in China and Italy, which are two markets that are far down that road. The other way of doing it is to go 100% or in reality, maybe 97% methanol and then have a, an ignition enhancer for the last 3% and use it in a diesel cycle. So you, you then sort of have a, a slightly different type of engine. But we can do either one. And we can do it in land transportation, as I think what you're alluding to, or we can do it in, in marine transportation and large ships as well. So it's, it's a fairly versatile fuel. Right. And, and that, those, of course, you mentioned a couple of, you know, uh, long haul freight trucking and marine shipping are two of the most problematic industries to decarbonize and to get down to net zero emissions. So help, help me understand this, Klaus. Do the engines and all of the components like fuel pumps and so on, uh, do they have to be specially made to run on 97% methanol or is it just a straight switch? Uh, it's it's somewhere in between. It's not a straight switch, but it, but it's pretty close. We work a lot with Scania, one of the big truck manufacturers. We actually buy their engines and then we modify them so that we can use them on on smaller type ships. And and it's a control system issue. It's a compression ratio issue, and it might something might be something to do with with uh, gaskets and fittings that need to be. Uh, I need to stand up to the slightly higher corrosion of methanol. But the physical engine block and all the, the hardware pieces are all the same. We, we see the same thing on the big two-stroke engines that MAN uses. It's the same engine block, but it needs dual fuel pipes instead of one fuel pipe. So a modification, uh, but not a major one, especially not if you're doing it in the factory. Then we're talking, you know, within three to five percent maybe of, of a cost premium, to use this kind of engine. Now, if you do that, however, you have a cost reduction on your, on your uh, what's it called, exhaust cleanup systems, the, the SCRs and so on. They're pretty big things you have to bulk on to engines to reduce the NOx or SOx level. By using methanol, all that part is avoided. We get the same quality emissions as those guys do when they use the, the emission cleanup system. Well, let's talk for a minute about how you make methanol because the idea of using hydrogen and captured CO2. So where do you get the hydrogen from and where do you get the CO2 from? So the hydrogen we make or we split water by using renewable additional electricity. So additional electricity means that when we get to build the plant, we will also make sure that a wind farm gets built. So we now have new renewable electricity that splits the water to make us the hydrogen. And, and when we split the water, we get hydrogen and oxygen. And then we take the hydrogen, combine it with the CO2, 
that we take from a point source or one location where you have a lot of it, like a pulp mill, and we prefer to use the biogenic CO2, so the one that comes from, from a, a wood or an organic source, and, and pulp mills and, and plants that run on wood pellets like you do in Canada would be places to source that CO2. So we, we basically bolt the hydrogen and the CO2 together, and when you do that, you actually get, get liquid methanol out of it, which I always get so fascinated. You put one gas together with another gas, and then it becomes a liquid. Uh, final question, Klaus. What is preventing countries like Sweden or Canada from adopting methanol as, you know, sort of as a diesel replacement? Because everyone's complaining about the uh, emissions from transportation and particularly from long haul trucking, which is you can't difficult to electrify. So why are, aren't we moving quicker on that? Because we, we need to move in sync with renewable energy costs. I mean, the, the cost of renewable energy have just now and, and the equipment cost that we are dealing with is all coming down rapidly, but it's only just now that we can produce a renewable methanol that is almost as expensive, but it is a little more expensive, but almost as expensive, at least as a biofuel. And, and in five years time, that will be much better and we will have much more capacity. And I would say by 2030, when we are looking at, at fossil fuel parity, then it would be possible to say, okay, now we can actually get the fuel or we can make the fuel in the market. We can now start to, to limit or, or force out the diesel or the marine gas oil or whatever the alternatives are. But it's too early because we just, we don't have anything. And then, then the cars would stop. The system would sort of not function. So we, we need to take this in, 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 in bits and pieces. But of course, in, anyone who's out there in the, in the European Union or, or in other places who want to help us accelerate can do that by making sure that we can move a little quicker. I mean, for us, it's taken quite a while to get our funding. If we would have, we could have saved a year if somebody said, you know, this is a really good idea. But, but it's, it's, I guess it's, it's part of growing up somehow. It's part of, part of the transition. Yeah, well, I, we see that all the time, right? I mean, the, uh, there are all kinds of technologies that are just becoming economic. And uh, as I'm fond of saying, uh, for that reason, the 2020s is going to be a very disruptive decade because we'll see things like methanol begin to push out fossil fuels and begin to transform how we you know, fuel uh, transportation and housing and industry and so on. But thank you very much, Klaus. Really appreciate this and good luck with your company. Thanks very much. Take care.